Okay, hi everyone, welcome to the session. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, my name is Marta, I'm a developer advocate and today I will be talking to you a little bit about interactive data exploration with PyFlink and Zeppelin notebooks. Just let me know in the chat if you can hear me, I think I'm not muted, but just in case uh, something's wrong, just ping me in the chat. Uh, so for those of you that have never heard about Viverica, it's a company I work for. Um, you might know it as the company that uh, of the folks that created Apache Flink. And what Viverica does besides working on open source Flink is offer uh, enterprise product that makes it a bit easier to, to deal and tame uh, your streaming applications in, in production. So, and since the beginning of last year, uh, the company is part of the Alibaba group, and you may or may not know that um, Alibaba is one of the biggest users of Flink out there, and they're also uh, one of the biggest contributors to open source Flink these days. So, if it's your also your first time hearing about Flink, uh, I'm going to try to give a really quick and really simple uh, introduction to what it does. So in the simplest form, uh, how you can think about Flink, it's just something that uh, allows you to continuously process data that comes from a disparate amount of uh, data sources. Then it allows you to do some computations and transformations on that data. As data flows through Flink, uh, it's also able to kind of remember the context of the data that it's processing. Um, and yeah, then it just lets you sync this data and to do whatever you need to like, could be API calls, you can just sync it to a uh, file system, updates to a database, uh, whatever. And what makes Flink really powerful is the way that it handles this context or the way it is able to remember these events. Um, and this gives you some really nice properties like low latency processing, fault tolerance when, th when something blows up, um, and still give you the highest level of guarantees that you can get, which is exactly once. And what makes Flink really flexible is doing uh, one at a time event processing. So it's, uh, some people out there call it like a real stream processor, uh, but yeah. So this, uh, this gives you a, a really, because it's in, if you think about it, it's such a simple, uh, concept that it gives you a really good primer to cover a really wide range of use cases. So from streaming analytics and machine learning to more classical uh, stream processing pipelines to Lambda style event-driven applications. And at the very base, uh, there are like these more classical, like I said, uh, core stream processing use cases that really build on these primitives uh, that that kind of uh, compose Flink, so like event streams, uh, states, and time. And these are use cases where engineers are really ex exploring these low-level primitives deep in the Flink API stack. So um, when you need to do very complex or very heavy computations and you have to do a lot of customization on your code, uh, and where the goal is really to maximize the performance, reliability of whatever you're building. So you really want to milk all the really good things uh, that Flink can offer you. And some examples of these uh, use cases are, for example, companies like Netflix that are using Flink to build their core data infrastructure. So Netflix uh, has this uh, internal data platform that I'm <laughs> not forgetting the name of, but they are processing three petabytes of events per day with Flink. You also have a lot of banks doing, doing fraud detection, uh, fraud detection uh, infrastructure built with Flink, like ING. They have a machine learning based um, fraud detection infrastructure built with Flink. And other kind of use cases, like, like at AWS, they do a lot of analysis for service monitoring and anomaly detection. And 
Then there is um, the side of streaming analytics and machine learning. And here Flink uh, is used a bit more on a higher level for or for more domain specific use cases that can be uh, easily modeled with something uh, like SQL or Python and like a more simple abstraction uh, like dynamic tables. And here the focus is not so much on not so much on 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 really going deep on Flink and really maxing it out, but more like on uh, logic to meet to meet some business requirements. And so you kind of want uh, you kind of expect some things like uh, state handling, execution optimization to be handled by Flink, and you don't really want to think about it. And these are use cases where you also might have. Um, you also might have requirements where you need to do some mixed batch and stream processing. For example, if you need to backfill some historical data into your pipelines. And the goal here um, of using these more higher level abstractions in Flink is to maximize uh, developer speed and autonomy. So basically, you, you want to make users, even if they don't use, uh, even if they don't know Java, you want to make um, you want to make users independent with whatever data needs they have. And some examples of use cases on this side of things are, for example, you have Weibo, which is one of the biggest social media platforms in China. They're using Flink to do unified online and offline model training. At Uber, they also they have a, their internal platform called Athena X. You may have, you may have heard of it. Uh, it just allows basically everyone in the company to just using pure SQL uh, to build our own end-to-end -end streaming analytics pipelines. And at Criteo, they also have, they also have their feature generation platform um, built with Flink. And kind of a testimonial of how flexible and how uh, wide the usage of Flink is, is that it really powers some of the largest companies in the world and serves really different industry verticals. So you have things from entertainment like uh, Netflix all the way to agrotech with uh, companies like John Deere, everyone using Flink for super different things, really interesting use cases, some of them using Flink at a scale that is kind of mind blowing. But the Problem, it's not really a problem, but the thing with Flink is that it's JVM based, right? So for a long time, it was never suited for uh, anyone that didn't know how to code in Java or Scala. And I don't think I need to convince uh, anyone here of the importance of Python these days for data processing or to convince anyone to switch to Java anyways. So, uh, but just in case, just to make a case here, um, Python is pretty stacked. So it has a very mature analytics uh, stack with very well-loved libraries like NumPy, Panda, Scikit-Learn. And these libraries are really intuitive for users and they're actually pretty fast. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the newer libraries for machine learning, natural language processing, and this kind of domains, more like in the data science space, you see that they are either being, um, either being written in or they are, built, they are being built first for Python users. So there's a huge ecosystem around Python, uh, especially for people doing data science. And Python is also pretty timeless. So if you look at the most popular libraries, I found this very curious because I had to kind of like do a bit of research because I haven't touched Python in a while. Uh, but if you look at the most popular libraries that developers use with Python still these days in 2020, five out of the top six are older than 12 years or are more than 12 years old. And Python itself is actually way older than Java too. So, And uh, although newer libraries like uh, TensorFlow and that kind of stuff are already being built in a way that really can uh, distribute uh, compute, the problem with these really older libraries is that uh, they're mostly restricted to data that can fit in memory and are mostly designed to run in a single core of a CPU. So 
This basically means that you're you're limited to whatever machine you're using to to run Python. And this is a this is a problem because I think we've all experienced it by now. Like these days, data is just splitting out of uh, everywhere constantly from different sources. It's being produced faster in uh, more formats. And then it's also at the same time requiring you to extract value from it faster and uh, for more different reasons, for more uh, different stakeholders. So it kind of is a challenge. And despite this, uh, and, despite, and despite that Python doesn't really scale, you still kind of want to use it. Uh, and you also want to use these powerful libraries, right? And you want to use it at scale and uh, in parallel. And this is one of the motivations behind uh, PyFlink. So PyFlink is, if you've heard maybe of um, PySpark before, PySpark has a much bigger legacy. PyFlink is pretty recent. Uh, but the motivation behind it is basically twofold. So um, people in the community thought about starting to support uh, Python in Flink, because in one way, uh, Flink is a really, really powerful engine for uh, large scale, large scale data processing. And so uh, in, one, in one hand, you want to expose all the functionality that you have in Flink to users beyond the JVM. And the second motivation is that you also want to distribute and scale the functionality of Python through Flink. So you want to be able to run, for example, Pandas and all its friends in parallel and at scale. And Flink, if there's one thing that Flink can do, it's definitely scale. So to give you an idea of uh, the scale that Flink can go to, everyone calls it the Alibaba scale because it's the biggest, um, biggest scale uh, use case known to us. So the biggest... Uh, Production installation that we know is uh, what Alibaba runs on this um, crazy shopping festival they, they have in November every year called the Double Eleven. And on this day, Flink is backing most of its uh, real-time data applications. So like search and recommendation, uh, ads, and even like this huge JVM dashboard that you see all over the media uh, when Double Eleven happens. Uh, what is kind of crunching everything uh, behind the scenes uh, so that you can see the nice uh, metrics is Flink. And so they are running Flink on over 5,000 machines. Uh, at peak, they are processing 2.5 billion events per second. And uh, they do all of this with sub-second latency. So even uh, serving, like um, doing their updates to uh, the feature vectors that go into the, the rec recommendation system, this is all done with sub-second latency despite uh, the volume of data that they're handling. So in a nutshell or a very uh, overview, what uh, PyFlink gives you is a high-level abstraction, kind of um, relational-like way to process data uh, with, a, with a table like uh, yeah, with a table-like uh, abstraction that is very similar to using SQL on a database, or it's pretty familiar if you already work with Python and uh, you work with tabular formats. So like if you use pandas, this should be pretty, pretty straight, straightforward for you. And besides all the operations that you would expect from a regular SQL-like engine, uh, like complex joins, aggregations, it also has support for um, advanced operations like time traveling, pattern matching, and uh, that kind of stuff. And I didn't mention it before. Well, I, I did mention it in the use cases for uh, streaming analytics that sometimes you want to do batch and streaming. And uh, Flink or PyFlink uh, allows you to do, uh, to handle batch and streaming workloads, each with their own uh, cost optimizer. So a lot of times, basically, you can use the same code to, to run, uh, to process real-time data, say, from Kafka or something like that, and then uh, to statically process a bunch of files that are stored in an S3 bucket. 
and it also allows you to extend uh, to extend your logic with uh, user-defined functions, also including vectorized UDFs or uh, known as pandas UDFs. They are much more performant in terms of serialization. And all of this is supported uh, by a growing ecosystem. You have uh, a lot of native connectors, some of them directly supported by the community, others are kind of externally maintained by other communities. Uh, you can consume every, basically every, every common format that you find out there. And there's also a machine learning library in the works. So you'll also soon be able to, to use that with Python. So, but today I want to go a little bit into using PyFlink with Apache Zeppelin notebooks. And here, I'm not really going to av advocate for or against notebooks here. I, uh, I wasn't really experienced with notebooks before I came up with this talk, but on the internet, I saw that there's a really great divide between people that love notebooks, people that hate notebooks, uh, Netflix using uh, notebooks to productionize stuff. So uh, this is not a hill I'm willing to die on today. It's not one of the goals of this talk to tell you if you should use notebooks or you shouldn't use notebooks. Turns out they're pretty great for data exploration uh, and they're pretty good for demos. So that's kind of like where I'm leaving it. And so Zeppelin, uh, if you've never heard about it before as well, open source, of course, uh, web-based notebook, provides you an interactive, collaborative computing environment. And uh, it has, uh, like I said, I'm not, I've never used notebooks professionally, uh, but I've heard um, of uh, other notebooks like Jupyter or Polynode, I've never tried them. So uh, these are basically some things that I think are really cool about Zeppelin in particular, and not really Zeppelin compared to anything else. Uh, but so what's great about, about Zeppelin is that it has support for a lot of different interpreters. So uh, you can use it with Flink, you can use it with Spark, you can use it uh, with R, uh, vanilla Python, you can use Bash, you can use Markdown, uh, and you can use all of them in the same notebook. I will show you, I will show you in the demo afterwards. You can just like compose a really nice, uh, compose a really nice uh, note with all uh, very different interpreters. And also uh, it has built-in interactive visualization. So it actually comes already with some really nice uh, visualizations that you can interact with. And Zeppelin also provides uh, its own visualization library. So you can expand um, called Helium that you can uh, use to expand the visualizations that are available out of the box. And I think one of the differentiators of Zeppelin from what I read is that it's built uh, from scratch for multi-tenancy. So it has a lot of features like uh, different interpreter bindings, binding modes for process isolation, different authentication methods. It also allows you to keep uh, versioning on, uh, on Git and this kind of stuff that makes it really good uh, if you're, if you have like, if if you want to share your notebooks and this kind of stuff. Okay, so moving on to the demo, I just need to disconnect my screen real quick and change it. Okay, Let's see, cool. Okay, it's here. Cool. So this is how the Zeppelin environment looks like. All you have to do to make it work with Flink really is come to the interpreters. And you can see here the amount of interpreters that it has. There's really a lot of stuff to choose from. So all you have to do to make it work with Flink is basically just point it at uh, your Flink installation. If you want to use PyFlink, uh, you point it to your the Python path where you have PyFlink installed. Okay. Cool, so this demo, it's not a super complex demo. Basically, 
Uh, we're just looking at a data set um, from Kaggle, and it's a data set about this uh, film platform called Mubi. It's like Netflix, but for hipsters. Uh, and I'm not going to a lot of adventures here, and I have basically pre-ran everything because I'm really afraid that my computer will freeze because it's not uh, yeah, very well endowed. So what we're doing here is we're just looking, plainly looking at some CSV files. So we're doing everything batch mode. Uh, but yeah, later you can just explore and you can easily just switch to streaming and also use it to, to look at some streaming data. So what we have is basically three different CSV files. First file has just some uh, reference data from all the movies that are registered in this platform. Uh, another file, which is a little bigger, uh, has ratings for all these move for all these films from the movie users, and this file has around 15 million rows. And the third file just has some aggregated data, aggregated user data regarding also two ratings. So Zeppelin offers, I think, five different interpreters for Flink. Here we are using a mix of PyFlink interpreter and also the batch SQL interpreter. And one of the good things of Zeppelin, if you just want to get up and running, is that it kind of um, it kind of just uh, creates the environment variables for us. So you don't really have to you don't really have to worry with uh, all the imports and all the configuration of your environment unless you want to do. Uh, unless you want to do some more customization, but like just to get started, you don't really need to, to worry about any of that. So, okay. So the first thing, uh, like I said, we, had, we have these uh, CSV files. First thing we want to do is we want to kind of load them onto Flink. So, uh, we want to create some. Uh, we want to create a source table from the movie CSV file, and the recommended and quickest way to define a source table in PyFlink is to use SQL DDL. So, like I said, uh, PyFlink support fully supports uh, SQL. So you can just uh, define you can just define your your tables using SQL DDL. You can also use you can also choose to use uh, the PyFlink. Uh, other specific interfaces, but this is the recommended and uh, the most straightforward way to really create a table. So uh, here I, just for the sake of uh, demonstration, I just uh, here gave you two different ways that you can create a table. So you can use, uh, you can use the PyFlink interpreter or you can use the batch SQL interpreter. Uh, and in both places, you basically can just use standard SQL uh, to really create a table. This is, is a regular create table statement that would run in any database. So here in the width part, you just define your connector. In our case, uh, it's a file system connector. I'm just connecting to, um, I'm just directing it to a, lo um, a CSV file that is stored locally. And I'm just telling Flink that it should serialize this as CSV. And, oh, sorry, I, for, I forgot to mention something that, uh, like I said, you can use multiple interpreters. You can see here that uh, here I'm using some markdown. So if you see like the, you see here is the markdown interpreter. Okay, and here, for example, you can just, you can just check with uh, some shell. You can have a look at your at your source files just to get an idea of just to get an idea how your how your data looks like before you define your table. So so yeah, here you can have like a feel for the data. You can see like what data types to use. You can see what's wrong. So you can see here that the year has a weird format. Uh, there's also here, you can see that for some fields, you have multiple values. So these are all things that when you're just like looking around and trying to explore the data and maybe clean it, uh, it's pretty useful that you can just, yeah, 
get a little subset of the data and then you can start building around that. So I pre-ran this, I created my table. I did also a count here to see um, from the table we created. I just wanted to select and see how many, how many records there in this table. We have around 200,000 records here. And now we can start just uh, using this table for uh, some exploration and see what we can find. Uh, so see what, what we can find in it. So we will use this uh, movie movies table to get um, the average movie popularity per movie release year. And the way you do it, the way you get the av average movie popularity release uh, per release year, you can see here that uh, it looks, it's, it's it's very familiar if you're from if you already know SQL, it's kind of the same way of thinking about it. So uh, from your batch table environment, you just select from the movie movie tables, you do a group by per year, and then you just select whatever you're interested in seeing. So um PyFlink and PyFlink has a lot of built-in functions that uh, you can use to wrangle around with data. So like you have string functions. Uh, yeah, and here you see that we're doing the average. So if you run this, which I have before, uh, you can choose from one of these visualizations in Zeppelin. So I hope I don't destroy it. Uh, please remember that it looked good uh, before I switched. So you can choose between really different uh, visualizations for the data that you have. And here you can see that it's like fully interactive. You can see all the data points. And okay, cool, because this is about kind of extracting some insights from whatever we're seeing. Uh, what we can see here, for example, is that there are two clear uh, outlier years when it comes to popularity, so or the average popularity. So you see here and here. Uh, and if you check further, there is only one movie release in each of these years on movie. So they were just really, really popular films that were released in this year. And we can also see that here in the 1920s, you have like a um, very busy period. And uh, I did some internet researching and this is apparently, um, this is apparently the decade for silent movies. So it seems like silent movies are also pretty popular with um, movie users. And you can also see that here, probably until the end of the 1960s beginning from the 20s, uh, you also have increased popularity for the movies. And this is uh, considered the golden era of Hollywood. So I guess this can, this can explain the increased popularity for movies in this, in this period. Okay, so moving forward, this is basically the same thing that we did above but for the other two files. So for the movie ratings file and for um, the aggregated data, we are just creating here uh, we are just creating two more tables from those data sources. And the only thing I'm going to risk, <laughs> I'm going to risk to do live is for example here, if we want to see all the tables that we have created so far, all the tables that are registered in Flink. We should have three tables. Okay. And that checks out. So we have movies table, ratings table, ratings user table. And we can just continue, or we can just use these two new tables that we just created. So another thing, or one of the first things that we can see based on the ratings uh, data is we can check the number of active users in the platform uh, over time. And uh, for this, I'm just using the rating activity. So I'm considering that a user was active if they did a rating on a certain day. So again, the, the way you construct your, um, your query is pretty straightforward. You select from the ratings table, you group by, uh, you group by year and month, 
And you see here again that you have some uh, built-in date, date handling functions that you can use. And we are just yeah doing an aggregate account and then ordering so that we have like a nice timeline. And what can we extract from here? So basically there is, it's pretty funny that there is a peak of active users every January 1st in every year. This is pretty likely when people are making their best of the previous year lists. And you can see, so you can see here, there's a peak. Here, there's a peak, January 2014, January, oops, January 2015. Let's see, there's a big peak, January 2019. So this is one of the first things that you can, that you can take out of this. And this data only goes until April of this year, but it still already captures, um, already captures like a boost in uh, activity from when the corona hit. So you can see that starting from after February, so starting from March, you can see that the activity is going up as people are getting locked down. So I guess people are seeing and reading more films than before. Whoops, I forgot to run this markdown. <laughs> Another thing you can do um, is just, because so far we've been looking at individual tables, uh, but one of the things that is interesting to do and that you kind of want to do in a performant way if you have huge amounts of data, it's not the case here, but anyways, uh, you, can enrich, uh, you can enrich data. So here, what we are going to do or what I uh, wanted to do was to get the top 10 rated movies in a, given, um, in a given year. And for this, you need two different tables. You need the movies tables where we will get uh, the title and the release year. And you need the ratings table where you can get uh, the, rating, the average rating score and you can also get the number of critics. So, uh, first here, because this table, like I told you before, has 15 million rows, one thing we want to do before actually joining them is kind of reduce the amount of data that we are using for that. So for the ratings table, um, I'm filtering out just by a specific year. And then I'm uh, aggregating, uh, grouping it, sorry. <laughs> Uh, that I'm just grouping it and calculating the average. So like doing all the um, kind of like just reducing it down and doing a lot of calculations already over this data before I actually join it with the movie table. And here for the year, uh, this is one cool thing that you can do with Zeppelin. You can use this dynamic forms. So here, this is basically the default year. So if you don't input anything, this is what um, will be used in the calculation but it can enter an arbitra arbitrary year here and it will be picked up uh, in the query. So, okay, and then you can just join these two tables. They have uh, one field in common, so movie ID. Here I had to give an alias to the movie ID because uh, they can have the, the columns can have uh, the same name. If you're if you're using them in a join, and yeah, so basically I'm just joining the two tables, um, and I am so that I can get oh okay, I'm joining the two tables and I'm uh, ordering them by the average rating they had, and because just using the average rating gave pretty bad results because. Uh, the rating score goes from zero to five and there are a lot of uh, similar, so the scale is really small. There were a lot of uh, similar ratings. So to make it a bit fairer or uh, more fair, I also used as a condition the number of user critics for each film. And so, yeah, and then I just fetched the, the top 10 and this is what you get. So this is for, 2000, and I think I ran it with 19. So for 2019, these are the 10 most popular uh, films 
according to user ratings and the number of user critics. So one last thing I wanted to show you is how to use pandas and other Python libraries with Flink. So one way to use uh, PyFlink with pandas is to first reduce the amount of data that you want to act upon. So uh, this is, like I said, one of the things that Flink is really good at is dealing with huge amount of data. Uh, if you want to use it with pandas, then you don't, you'll kind of want to pre-process that into something that is manageable on pandas. Um, and so you can just use PyFlink to shrink everything down and then convert the resulting table into a pandas data frame. And this is what we are doing here. So we are getting, we are selecting from the biggest table, the ratings table. We are just filtering out. We just want um, data that is from 2018 to 2020. And then we just select uh, the year and the rating score. And then all you have to do so that you can kind of transfer this uh, to work with pandas is just convert uh, convert your PyFlink table to uh, pandas data frame. And then you can use pandas. Uh, for example, here we are using pandas to, uh, to render a histogram. This is something, of course, that you could never do with PyFlink by itself. But by using PyFlink with pandas, you can actually crunch your data, then move back to pandas, plot a nice histogram, not as nice as the, as the built-in visualizations in uh, Zeppelin because it's not interactive at all. Also because I made it very rudimentary. Uh, yeah, but this is a way, other way you could also use PyFlink um, with these libraries is to write some custom code as a pandas UDF and then just ship that to the phone cluster. And I have no idea how I am in terms of time but I have to switch again my monitor so that I can finish up. Okay, so that's, that was basically it for the demo. If you want to learn more about Flink, we also have our community conference coming up in October. It's free. There will be uh, some talks about by Flink. Uh, there will be some talks about other Flink APIs. So if you're interested just in general to learn more about Flink, you can join that as well. And thank you so much for attending the talk. I have no idea if I'm going, if I've gone over time, but if you have any questions, just feel free to drop them here. You can also reach out to me on the ASF Slack. You can also reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions. So there's a question from Martin. Any plan to support other notebooks like Jupyter? Uh, there have been discussions about supporting Jupyter as well, but uh, I don't think this is in the immediate roadmap, but you will be able to use, like in the, um, the commercial offering from my company, you can use uh, Jupyter Notebooks. It has integration with Jupyter Notebooks, but you can only use it with uh, SQL, not really PyFlink itself. So the short answer is with in open source Flink, not for now, but uh, if there are enough users asking for it, then uh, the community will probably listen to you. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Cool. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, I shared the link to the slides if you're interested. Uh, I will at some point put this up on my GitHub, on a GitHub repo. I didn't have time to make a nice setup so that everyone could use this, uh, but I will at some point. So if you want to keep an eye on Twitter, I will just uh, share it there once I have it. Okay, thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the conference.